right. Well, we have another Vince question here. This was sent in the corny drive through gmail.com from Christopher James Graham. I came across a series of That's a person who sounds way too snooty. We'll see about that. I came across a series of stories on Twitter about Vince. I was wondering if we can get Jim's thoughts on their veracity and if he's heard any of these before. And I have a Twitter thread here by a friend of the show, Alan Blackstock, on Twitter, at Alan underscore Cheap Shot. <laughs> Let's hear if you know any of these stories, if you can confirm or deny them. All right. Vince hates sneezing. When someone sneezes, he yells at them and tells them to control themselves. On the rare occasion Vince sneezes, he angrily mutters to himself and loses focus <laughs> for a few minutes. This was said by Paul Heyman on Chris Jericho's podcast. I can testify to part of that. I've ever never actually seen Vince sneeze, I don't believe. I It seems like that would stand out. Nobody Now it seems like everybody knows that Vince doesn't like sneezing. But nobody actually in 1996 told me specifically, don't ever sneeze around Vince. It, because I remember one specific time, I think it was, God, I can't remember, but it may have been in early 97. I remember I was real sick at WrestleMania that year with some kind of bronchial thing or whatever. But anyway, it's a writing day. We go to Vince's and I knew enough to know that you can't just call in sick with Vince, right? Uh, but at the same time, I'm fucking sick. So I'm there, but you know, I'm ready to do what I'm going to do, but I can't control that. I'm coughing and wheezing and sneezing every once in a while and, and stopped up and just, I'm miserable, right? You know, my eyes are water, whatever. If I've got a bad cold or whatever. So I'm trying to do the old, I'll put up the brave face and I will basically demonstrate my suffering to where that any normal human being would have pity and would say, you know what, you're sick, go home, get some rest, right? So that I can't ask, but I can accept that offer, right? I figure it's just a matter of time before anybody will make this offer. The offer wasn't coming. I'm fucking, and I really am fucking miserable. I'm not having to sell it too bad, and I'm doing the best act, but I'm just... <laughs> And Vince is, he's giving me all the faces and he's looking at me, you know, and finally he's, are you all right? I said, oh, I'll be okay, Vince. Cause you got to fucking, you know, you got to plead your case. You got to be a plaintiff. You got to say, no, I'll be okay. Cause that's part of the fucking, what making it look good. Right. Then he wouldn't come back with, are you sure? You know, he was, so then a few minutes later, I'll have to make some more noise. And he, Come here. Are you going to be all right there? I, well, yeah, yeah, Vince, I'll, I'll, I'll make it somehow. And you always, you know the rule of this, Brian. You always wait till the offer is made and you turn the offer down the first time and the offer maker insists, right? That's the way it works. <laughs> That's the fucking rule. So finally the offer comes. Well, Jim, do you think you need to go home? Oh, no, Vince, I'll, I'll be all right. <laughs> All right, then, page six. I'm like, motherfucker. He did not He did not insist. He broke the rule. And I had to sit there all day, and I was fucking miserable. I'm sure I fucking had a fever. But no, he, you know, that's his, and then after the fact, you know, became that, you know, he not only doesn't put sickness over, but he doesn't like to see displays of it. Well, he should have told me to go home then. He wouldn't have had to look at it. Vince once raced former WWE writer Court Bauer on an open highway. Vince boxed in Court so that Court was heading straight for road construction. Court had to slam on his brakes to avoid an accident. Vince sped off, having won the race by almost killing a guy. That is true. <laughs> <laughs> I can't really add anything to it. That's, that's true. Vince went bowling with an NBC executive. <laughs> the guy had done something Vince didn't like. Obviously, so. obviously, since they were bowling, they were wearing bowling shoes. Vince sneaked off, got the guy's real shoes from behind the counter, tossed the shoes in the garbage, and left. The guy had no idea where his shoes were and had to go home wearing the gross bowling shoes. Vince contacted him later and said, that's what you get, pal. The guy wrote a book and said that Vince was the biggest jerk he'd ever met in real life. 
No, but wait a minute. He didn't throw the guy's shoes away. Didn't he just take one shoe and take it with him? I believe so. And I believe the story yeah. was it was potentially a birthday party for Dick Ebersol and the person whose shoes were stolen by Vincent Pat Patterson, I believe. Yeah. Was Frank the Ford. That's right. Yes, it was. It was yes. It was a party for Ebersol, but DeFord, the sports writer, got his shoes stolen. Vince. But they, they did, he didn't throw them in the garbage. He actually took them with him so they wouldn't be there. Vince, as a prank, had real police arrest Jonathan Coachman for running a betting pool at work. Coach said that when the cop car finally turned around and brought him back to WWE headquarters, he openly wept in relief and rage. Well, yes. And I mean, that's uh, the classic have a guy arrested rib. They they arrested me in Spartanburg one night. I've told that story before. They had Arn Anderson in the back of a police car in Charlotte uh, at the Coliseum, allegedly on a statutory rape charge, and he was shitting himself until he looked out the, the back window and there was fucking Flair and Tully and whoever else leaning in laughing at him, and they let him out of the car. Uh, yeah, it's an old to have one of the boys arrested. It's just, you got to get one of the guys that hasn't been around long. So they're not smart to it and get the cops to go along with it. But in those days, you know, cops were regulars. So, uh, yes, that is true. Also. Vince got wasted at a strip club and let the heart foundation hit their finisher on him and they hit him really hard. I don't remember whether it was a strip club or just a hotel bar. Do you? I don't remember, but I believe it was the Hart Foundation after the Legion of Doom had hit the Doomsday Device. <laughs> yeah, well, see, he he wanted this. This was back in the eighties, but by the time that I knew him in the nineties, no, this was could, this, this was ninety two, I believe. Okay, well, the the pre the pre trial era, um, and I guess that maybe after he had that neck surgery, he didn't take too many of the guys' finishes anymore. But, uh, yes, he would occasionally uh, go out and partake in adult beverages with the boys, and on this particular night, somehow or another, he decided he was going to take all the guys' finishes. And somewhere or another, the Road Warriors managed to do the doomsday device on him to where it didn't fucking kill him, but the Heart Foundation cinched up and were a little snug with him while they had the opportunity. Vince said something insulting to Kofi Kingston on a plane, and Kofi didn't do anything. As they were getting off the plane, Chris Jericho told Kofi that if he didn't confront and fight Vince immediately, Kofi's career was effectively over in Vince's mind. This was how Vince tested his talent. Uh, well, that story is true. Jericho's told it. I wasn't there, obviously, at that point in time. But it it's almost like if Vince has, has gotten younger uh, mentally... <laughs> that because when i knew him he he it's not like he would have turned back down from a fight from anybody but he didn't actively want to fucking fight or fucking whatever with the boys but somehow in the the decade after that he's you're always hearing the stories about either somebody has to stand up to him wrestle him threaten to fight him or get on the plane and fucking face lock him or whatever but uh but that story is true Former 90210 writer Larry Molan joined Stephanie's creative team. They were in a meeting with Vince. Vince was talking. Larry was nodding. Stephanie pulled Larry out of the room. She told him, quote, you need to stop nodding. Vince <laughs> hates nodding. She explained that if there's one thing Vince hates, it's a yes man. This is extra hilarious because everyone always says that Vince is surrounded by yes men. Poor Larry lasted just a couple of weeks. <laughs> I, you know, once again, I never had him, never saw him yell at anybody for nodding or speak ill of anybody for nodding, but I'm not a big nodder. I don't nod a lot. I don't know that Bruce ever nodded a lot. I didn't see a lot of people around him nodding. Maybe I just caught him at the wrong time with a lot of non-nodders. So you think that's probably true? Well, I mean, it, if if they tell that story because it sounds like something that Stephanie would say. Vince I, I can't dispute it, is what I'm saying. Vince invited Mark Henry to a workout session. Bear in mind that Mark Henry's claim as the world's strongest man is based on the fact that he is the only man to have competed at top-level Olympic lifting, powerlifting, and strongman competitions. Vince tried to out-rep him on every exercise. 
Henry went along with it because he's competitive and even admitted that Vince tested him a little bit. Mark says that he actually quit before Vince did. Vince phoned Mark in great pain and admitted he had made a terrible mistake. You know anything about this story? I haven't heard it, but I can believe it. It's a, it sounds entirely believable. Vince was hesitant to hire Gail Kim due to her being Asian. Jim Ross convinced him not only because of her in-ring talent, but the fact that many men are attracted to Asian women <laughs> and that there are even lots of Asian porn sites on the internet. This apparently shocked the hell out of Vince, who had no idea Asian porn sites existed. I have heard JR tell that story, so yes. Uh, and, uh, you know, well, that's a... Well, you're talking about a guy that never even saw television. I don't know when he would have time to look at entertainment on the internet. So, I'm, you know, Vince may be like fucking Quagmire when they, they tipped him to the fact there was porn on the fucking internet. He didn't know it. And then he, you see him three days later, his right arm is three times as big around as his left one. I, you know, but, uh, but all I, the Vince McMahon's idea of a drop dead gorgeous woman is fucking sable, as we've mentioned before. And the only thing that I was ever able to glean of Vince's romantic preferences is that he and Shitstain were both all fired up over the idea of seeing Sable wearing white cotton panties. And I just fucking zoned out when they, when they would go into those discussions. The McMahons playing pool at their holiday home in Boca, Triple H and Stephanie against Vince and Linda. It was supposed to be a fun family game, and Vince turned it into a serious competition. Triple H and Stephanie kept getting lucky and were winning. Vince was getting mad at Linda because she was making their <laughs> side lose. Eventually, Stephanie ended up potting for the win, and he cracked up and stalked off. Later that night, she called him through the intercom and sang, you're tied to the whipping post, Dad, to piss him off. And from their bedroom, Steph and Triple H could hear him literally screaming in anger on the other side of the house. <laughs> well, the only person that could have told that story would have been Stephanie. So I would have to believe that because she would have been there. Tiger Ali Singh complained to Vince about making him wear a turban and traditional Indian garb, <laughs> telling him it was offensive to his people and a desecration. Vince replied, Quote, you and D-Lo are going to put those fucking turbans on. I don't care about desecration. <laughs> Is there any truth to that? You would have been there, maybe. Oh, yeah. Well, I don't know if I was specifically standing in front of him. But yeah, Tiger Ali Singh, I was there for that whole debacle. Tiger Ali Singh was the son of Tiger Jeet Singh. Tiger Jeet Singh was a huge wrestling personality in the Toronto market and the Ontario area in general, and also in Japan where he'd had a long run with the Noki's company. Like if, if the she when the Sheik was, was Baba's crazy guy, Tiger Jeet Singh was Inoki's crazy guy. He came out with the, with a turban. Tiger Jeet Singh, the father did came out with a turban and he, what is he? Pakistani or Hindu of some description. Um, and he had a, a sword saber type of thing, and he would beat up the fans on the way to the ring. I didn't let you answer that question, Brian. Is he is a Hindu of some description, correct? I believe so. Yes. Okay. I'm not certain. Of and that, well, I'm not trying to be racist here, but you know, that's why the name Tiger Jeet Singh he is from some Middle Eastern country or whatever. And there is a large population in Ontario, especially in Toronto of his the people, which is why that he was very over at one time in Toronto and had all kinds of, you know, sellouts with the Sheik and blah, 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 and, and made a lot of money there. So anyway, Tiger Jeet Singh is retired at this time. It's 1996 or whatever, seven, but he's a rich guy. I think there's a school in Ontario named after him. Is there not? There is. I believe it's what, yeah. in Canada. It's him and is it Whipper Billy Watson? Are those him and Whipper guys? Billy Watson. Yeah. yeah. But, I mean, you know, he's still a name in a community. He's a rich guy. He made money, put it into real estate, whatever. His son wants to get into wrestling. They should have named him George Singh. But anyway, his son is a big, tall, good-looking guy. 
We see the pictures, and they, as some way or another, the deal is going to be that not only is if if they take Tiger Ali Singh, the son, and the Ali was to honor Muhammad Ali because they're Muslim, whatever they're, the the people, the the lineage they are, whatever they're Muslim. So the Tiger Ali Singh is to honor his father and Muhammad Ali. And not only if we take the son and use him, then Tiger Jeet Singh has some connections in the Middle East that is going to get these huge paid tours, right? And as we know, Vince has always been a, a big fucking fan of paid, huge paid tours to the Middle East, right? So this was 25 years ago. So, and also there was talk about it. He, you know, he's so influential in Toronto, but we held, we were already doing fucking big business in Toronto. But they signed Tiger, Tiger Ali Singh. And he's one of those guys, not only is he, he's greener than a pepper tree. He, his dad has worked with, his dad was not a, an accomplished worker as far as wrestling. He did his gimmick. He was like the Sheik. He did his gimmick, and if it was anybody else doing it, it was bleh, right? Would you attest to that? He was not very good in the ring. And he was and he was not even as over as the Sheik, but he just had those pockets of places and because of his ethnic heritage where he was very influential. Although he looked really cool in the Japanese magazines when you see photos. It was like, wow, this guy has a saber and he's out there yes. doing crazy stuff, but then you'd watch the matches and it was like, oh boy. Yeah, it was brutal. But anyway, so but also Tiger Ali Singh thinks that he should be a big star from the start because he's you know imagine if this the Sheik telling his son Captain Ed George he should be a star times twenty. Tiger Ali Singh is deterred. He's supposed to be a big star. He's dry on promos. He just he wasn't an outgoing personality. He got heat with the boys. It he had. He had heat because he wasn't very good and also because they'd signed him and were trying to give him somewhat of a push. And I think, I can't remember whether the turban episode was, bef they tried him out and his father made some appearances and then come to find out, wouldn't you know who won the pony? <clears throat> Those paid Middle Eastern appearances didn't actually pan out. Apparently the way, if, if they panned out at all, I can't remember, but the, there wasn't a lot of money in the pan if they did pan out. And suddenly, Tiger Jeet Singh is not making any more appearances, and they've got Tiger Ali Singh on this contract. And I can't remember whether the turban thing, as I said, was either before or after they finally gave up and sent him to Puerto Rico. Uh, any They had a relationship at the time with whichever... What, what IWA was what Victor Quinones was with back at that time, right? Yeah. Uh, so they, they sent Tiger Ali Singh to Puerto Rico. They sent Russ McCullough, my big seven foot fucking abortion from OVW. They sent him to Puerto Rico, whoever they wanted to run off of a developmental deal that they couldn't break any other way. Cause these were the early ones. <laughs> they sent them to Puerto Rico, figured they could run them off. And finally, I think they ended up in some kind of lawsuit. I, if I'm not mistaken with tiger ali singh by the time that they ended their contractual relationship but so i can but yes you're gonna put these fucking turbans on at that point if he wanted him to wear a fucking ballet tutu they were doing everything they could do to to first they did everything they could with him and then they did everything they could to get rid of him with old tiger ali singh a few years ago the company had a snow cone party kind of weird i know this was in the back lot of the TV studio, not the actual large headquarter building that everyone always sees. Well, apparently Vince is a huge snow cone fanatic. <laughs> so much so that he had a lot of them. Like 10. At one point, he got up and announced in front of everyone in his Mr. McMahon, you're fired voice that he loves snow cones. It was awkward. And I had to fight to hold back my laughter. It was surreal. I'm not sure who said that, but it's in quotes. I can believe that also. I've never seen Vince eat a snow cone, but I can believe that that story might be true. Vince thinks throwing or pushing someone into a swimming pool while fully clothed <laughs> is the funniest thing on planet Earth. On planet Earth, excuse me. I could attest to that being true because I've been one of the people in the pool. Uh, and... Uh, <laughs> It wasn't bad weather, thankfully. It was one of the days that we were writing out by the pool because it was good weather. But toward the end of the day, 
I can't remember how that I bit on the hook, but it was something to the effect of Bruce was saying, well, there was something he, I, he couldn't believe that Vince had that written on the bottom of the pool. I said, what? Yeah, Vince had whatever the fuck it was he's telling me written on the bottom of the pool. And I, he said, you can see it from right there. So I go over and as I'm looking, trying to see, it was just the 16, not 16 foot, but the six foot or whatever fucking depth. And I said, that's, and right then there's Vince's hands from behind, whoo, straight in the fucking pool. Oh God, he loved it. Everybody apparently that has been to, say he never did it to Pat, I don't think, but everybody that's been to Vince's house for a work day has been in the pool apparently, or at least at, as of that point they had. And so then I've got no fucking clothes because my clothes are wet, right? I've got to go home. So he said, oh, here, pal. And he got me a sweatshirt and a pair of sweatpants. And, and it was actually a jacket. I remember I got a jacket to wear uh, home. So it must have been spring briskish as it got dark. And it, the jacket, I said, I'll bring this back to you. He said, oh, don't worry, pal, keep it. Well, it was, the sleeves looked like a straight jacket because Vince is a lot taller and bigger than me in the upper body. Uh, so I had it in the closet for a long time. And then when I moved, I should have kept it. But it was like one of those jackets that probably was a designer jacket, probably not a suit jacket, but a coat, probably paid $500 for it. And he didn't give a shit. I said, oh, don't worry, keep it. But yes, I've been in the pool. One time... He got drunk and urinated on Ric Flair's hotel bed. <laughs> I have not heard that. I've heard that. Okay. Paul Heyman talked about Vince's competitiveness. Vince supposedly has a world-class thick beard, but shaves constantly. <laughs> Heyman asked Vince why he doesn't just let the beard grow out and save himself the trouble, and Vince's answer was, I can't let it win. <laughs> well, we've told the shaving story here just recently, so we're not going to talk about it. But yeah, he shaves constantly with his electric razor that he keeps in his briefcase in the back of the limo. He's fucking grinding it on his face. So I can believe that even if it came from Heyman. Vince holds a meeting with all of the talent announcing the switch to PG programming. Michael Tarver stands up and asks a question. <laughs> Vince's response Excellent question, Shelton. <laughs> oh my God. I heard that a long time ago. I heard that a long time ago. See No Evil, the film that Kane did. Vince wants this scene in the movie where Kane's character pulls out his penis and he wants it to be three feet long. I thought there was a connection problem. I said, Greg, can you just back up and repeat that last line for me? He goes, yes, Vince wants Kane's penis to be three feet long, and none of the producers are saying anything about it. <laughs> uh, well, here's one of your stories. Jim Cornette was at Vince's house, and Vince had somebody from the cable company working on a TV yeah. because the sound wouldn't work. The guy came up to Vince holding the remote control and explained to him what a mute button was, and that mute was on. Vince gave him a $100 tip. Is that accurate? That is I've witnessed that with my own eyes. And it wasn't like he was working on the TV. So here's the thing. When we'd be there, Vince, Linda would be at the office. She still worked in the office on the other end of the fourth floor. Um, and she would go to the office every day. So the only people there in the house would be the couple. The, and gosh, I can't remember their names. But this man and this woman, they were a married couple. <clears throat> and they lived there and did the cooking and housework and cleaning and things. And they lived in some... I don't know. There was a there was an old building in the back that was like a three car garage or whatever. That when Shane got married to Marissa, Vince had that renovated. Spent like a couple of hundred grand renovating it and gave it to him for a wedding present. But I so I think the 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 live in couple lived in another wing of the actual house. But anyway, otherwise than that, there was nobody there. And if they would be off doing errands or going to shopping or whatever the fuck, it was just us. Well. Uh, at one day, but you would see people on a regular basis. They'd be wandering around either on the grounds or in the house. Cause there was always some work going on. Uh, uh, groundskeepers would be there or somebody would be coming in to do something. Well, on this particular day, we're sitting there in the dining room and, and the doorbell. And I guess Vince goes up cause the couple was gone. So Vince goes up and opens it. Oh yeah, pal, come this way. And it's the guy from the cable cable company. He says right back there. And he points to the room, the little, living room they had around the edge past the kitchen and the dining room 
It's where that big painting of Vince is on the wall with that big opulent frame. He's got the big arms and everything. Um, but anyway, he said, back there, pal, uh, there's no sound. So we're sitting there, and the guy comes back around the corner like a minute and a half later with the remote in his hand. And he says, uh, sir, see this, the mute button? That's what the problem was. Oh, thank you, Pat. He reaches in his pocket and hands the guy a $100 bill. But uh, there would be so many people wandering around there sometimes. Vince would look up and just see some guy that he had no idea who the fuck it was walking down his hallway, and he'd shake his head and say, I don't know who these people are. But there, uh, uh, one time, we're working out by the pool. It's me and Bruce and Vince. And Pat's supposed to come over, but he hadn't showed up yet. Well, Vince has to go in and take a private phone call in his study. So me and Bruce are sitting there by the pool. Pat shows up. Oh, Pat sits there, and we start now with <clears throat> with Pat, where Vince is not the king of chit chat. Vince, you know, has to you have to be talking about something of substance. Pat just loves to chit chat, and we sat there and we just bullshitting back and forth, enjoying the weather, whatever. But finally, Pat's like, "Fuck, is he ever going to come out here?" He's got that accent, and you know, it's like he knows. Sometimes you would literally sit there on some writing days. You would sit there for an hour and a half or two hours, just twiddle your dick to wait for Vince to come out of some telephonic conference. So we said, "I don't know. He's been in there a while." So, Pat, I don't know whether he saw a reflection through the window, like he thought he was coming, or he just said, well, "Just watch this." He went around, but he waited for a couple minutes around the where the pool is. It's landscaped. And there's these bushes, and you can't really see past the barbecue area at the end of the pool. And there was already, there was the groundskeepers were doing their work, right? All around, you hear the lawnmower down the way, and you hear this guy's raking and doing his thing. Well, Pat goes around the deal. Vince comes out. He doesn't know Pat's there. Pat has gone around to one of these fucking landscapers and got his leaf blower. And it's one of those fucking gasoline-powered leaf blowers where you can really rev that thing up, right, and cause some turbulence in the air. And so as Vince sits down, he starts talking again. He says, all right, where were we? Pat starts revving that thing up behind the bushes. And now Vince, all morning, we've been talking about his his Mexican ground grounds crew, right? The the What the fuck was it? Uh, it, his Mexican ground crew had a Italian name because they're in Connecticut. So it's like the Lambrini brothers, but every single one of them is Mexican. So we were laughing about that. So anyway, Pat's got this fucking leaf blower. Vince doesn't know Pat's there. Pat starts revving that thing up right behind the bushes on the other side of the fucking railing from the pool area where we're sitting. And it's like he's doing the work and Vince has seen him all morning. So he's, he looks over and he kind of disgusted, like, ah, oh, this guy's right on top of us now. And he continues talking, and Pat revs it up louder. And Vince just, he looks over his shoulder again. And he's like, continues talking. And then Pat revs it up louder. He blows through the bushes, and now the wind's coming through the bushes and it's blowing Vince's shit. And Vince looks over his shoulder, hey, amigo, amigo, por favor, or whatever he's trying to fucking. <laughs> And in response to this, Pat revs the shit up and just fucking floors the goddamn gasoline leaf brower. It's the loudest thing, and he's shooting the wind straight through the goddamn bushes. And Vince's toupee is almost ready to come off. No, I'm kidding. It's, but he's fucking hair and everything, and the shit's flying all off the table. And Vince gets up and goes around like he's going to go on the other side of those bushes and cut a promo on this motherfucker. And he goes, hey, amigo! And just then Pat fucking leans around from the other side of the bushes. And he sees it. And now he's got to laugh because Pat got him. And he loves Pat. So he's fucking horse laughing. But that's the kind of shit that, they would, that we would occupy ourselves with. Well, that ends the Vince McMahon portion <laughs> of the drive through today. A lot of people have been fascinated by Vince's behavior the last few weeks, more than... Uh, what? The last few weeks? Well, we have never received people, the... People have been fascinated about Vince's behavior for 35 fucking years. The amount of questions that have been coming in have been extraordinary about Vince.